time to podcast. Welcome everyone into the Hyper Time, the Hyper Time to podcast. And we are back after about a month hiatus, so let's see if we can shake the ring rust off and uh, get this going without a hitch here. But if we stumble, that will be my excuse as to why. And by we, I mean myself, Josh Miller, and my co-host, Alan Muir. Alan, how are you doing? Hyper Time to podcast, now with 50% less cocaine. <laughs> I don't know, we might need that cocaine to make it through this podcast, but we'll see. So, what are we talking about this week? Well, you know how we were originally trying to do, like, an issue based on whatever episode number we were on? Yeah. Obviously, there's uh, no bigger issue for the number 15 than the one we're going to talk about today that uh, brought the world Spider-Man. So we're going to be discussing Amazing Fantasy 15. That was written back in, I believe it was 1964. Of course, I don't have that year up here in my notes right away. I mean, just think of whatever year it was that Marvel had the had that uh, on like on every comic for a certain a certain while. There was the Spider-Man logo and the 30 next to it. Just a little brain shortcut. <laughs> yeah, did I really not put the year anywhere in. God, we'll, we'll we'll see. We'll get to it. <laughs> So yeah, we're going to discuss Amazing Fantasy 15. Um, obviously, one of the probably biggest issues in terms of importance in the history of comics because it brought about one of, if not, well, I would say one of the most popular characters in the history of the world, basically, in Spider-Man. So uh, there is a few other stories in this issue, but I don't think anyone really knows or talks about those at all. They're kind of cool. They're... Kind of like a weird Tales of the Crypt sort of stories um, that I really enjoyed. But really, it's it's Spider-Man. Spider-Man is the reason to come to Amazing Fantasy 15. It's not like Action 1 where you had the just the craziness or not craziness. That's not that's not the best way to describe the 30s. <laughs> More like the golly D by gosh way that the stories were told back then. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, we've done several of the, like, 30s and 40s stories so far, and they definitely have their own kind of uh, way of being written, and we'll have another one here in two weeks as well. But, yeah, this one definitely reads a little bit more modern, even if it does have a little bit of the Stanley flair to it, which is always enjoyable. I, I enjoy that little Stanley, <laughs> that little Stanley oomph to his stories. This has nothing to do with the, uh, the what Spider Man, but have you ever seen the video of Stanley? I think I'm pretty sure it was his assistant who made who animated the video of him saying "fuck." <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, I showed my sister that, and I just said, "This is like it's like hearing hearing my grandparents swear." swear. I just can't picture it. <laughs> yeah, because I'm trying. To, like usually back in all of his interviews, he's just kind of this happy-go-lucky guy who realizes how lucky he is to have gotten where he is, and he always just seems like that cool grandpa, and then you hear, then you watch that little video, and you're like, that guy's a little dirty man, isn't he? <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely some Stanley stuff in here. Um, some of it's uh, a little bit more controversial, but I think it's also some of that controversy that everyone is aware of that kind of surrounds Stanley with not just Spider-Man, but other characters as well throughout his career. So yeah, let's, I guess, go ahead and get into the creation of Spider-Man here. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, any size, catches seeds, just like guys, look out, here comes the Spider-Man. After having created the Fantastic Four and the Hulk, um, Stan's publisher, Martin Goodman, wanted Stanley to try and create another hero. However, he had to find someone who had a power that nobody else did. And Stan has this story that he will tell anytime he comes up with the origin of Spider-Man. And he's not sure if it's true anymore, but he's told it so much that he believes it's true at this point. 
Um, so he says that when he was trying to think of a uh, power, he would he was seeing this fly crawling along the wall, and he was thinking, what if someone could stick to the wall like an insect? And so he decided to come up with the name Spider Man after running through several different names that kind of were insect based, like Fly Man or Mosquito Man, stuff like that. But it was Spider Man. They basically stuck because he thought it sounded both mysterious and dramatic. Now, when it comes to some other stuff, Steve Ditko, co-creator, even though we'll uh, get to some of that later, uh, says the original plan was to give Peter a ring, which would help him transform into this adult hero of Spider-Man. However, Ditko said it sounded too similar to The Fly by Joe Simon over at Archie Publications, so they kind of ended up doing away with that. And then they would start toying around with some other ideas. One thing, um, Stanley thought it would be fun to give the hero a m- more personal problems and make him a teenager, which was something that not many heroes were doing stuff like that at the time. Um, and so he was putting those together. He was going to make Peter a nerd, just someone without many friends, and just you know kept spiraling from there, make him an orphan. And just all these problems that we associate with Peter now that made him a more unique character than what we were seeing a lot at the time. And even in some cases, still today, (laughs) Peter kind of had all those problems thrown at him. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to make a comment, but just by looking at the the, uh, document, I realized that, oh, wait, no, that's that's right in the middle. The uh, three stand quotes. (laughs) Yeah so, so. yeah, so when Stan was trying to, like, pitch this idea, he claims that it almost never happened. He was receiving a lot of pushback from his publisher because all of these were considered the worst ideas that he had ever heard. Um, so some of these denials were ones that Stan thought were kind of absurd. Um, so one was that you can't name him Spider-Man because people hate spiders. That's a, actually that's a legitimate fear. Yeah. So I don't see why, I don't see how that could happen. (laughs) Or I don't see how that couldn't happen. Yeah, I wonder if they had like the art and stuff up by this point. Because it's not like the costume is exactly the most horrifying thing in the world. (laughs) But I I, I assume that if you just gave him the name Spider-Man, that could definitely lead to some thoughts crossing him around. Like, "Mm, I I don't know about that. The name Spider-Man in the 60s said something. If they'd created Spider-Man, if if this whole pitch happened and like when uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly came out, and they, someone just had an idea, just the a, a thought of a man and a spider melding, like Jeff Goldblum and that fly did, mm-hmm. it'd just be a and like a living nightmare. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, listeners, if that if I just gave you a, a nightmare with <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nightmare fuel with that, just that mental image. And if you haven't seen that and want a nightmare, please go look it up. So another one of the critiques that he was given when it came to the Spider-Man character was that you can't feature a teenager as a superhero. Teenagers can only be sidekicks. Yeah, that's that's. I was really gonna say, <laughs> at up to that point, the only actual like teenage hero that was. An actual like popular hero was Superboy, but that but that was not Connor Kent Superboy, or something that was the younger adventures of Clark Kent. Mm-hmm. The way I see it, there's only kind of like it's either that or they're just sidekicks or wards. Like I'm not sure if Wally West existed at this time, but oh no, yeah, Wally didn't exist at all. But he's yeah. like he's like the prominent, or no? Would, would you say Rick, Rick Jones? Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to think, like the ones that come to mind for me are the Legion of Superheroes. Yeah, but you know, it's not one single character; it's a whole bunch of them. So maybe that kind of made it a little bit easier to write around, as opposed to having a book you know focused on one specific teenager all the time. And then the last one that Stan likes to mention is that you can't give a hero so many problems. Readers won't think he's heroic enough. I'm not even sure what to say about that. Like, <laughs> Yeah, because like, the whole point of heroism is 
defeating adversity. Mm-hmm. And, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things where, was this really said? Yeah, I don't know, like, I understand, like, you don't want, that there were probably definitely heroes that were, like, supposed to be perfect and nothing could go wrong with them, but at the same time, if you don't give them anything to overcome, then... <laughs> this is literally the Superman problem. Yes. From the, that was probably happening around this time, or maybe ten, ten, ten years prior in the 50s. Yeah, you figure, like, a lot of the problems with Superman in particular were, want like, self-made ones for, like, the purpose of hiding his identity and everything, like, making Clark a bumbling idiot and all this, and making yeah, him, like, look weaker, just... <laughs> D- Danny O'Neill s- said it perfectly. There was an issue of... There was a Superman comic where he blew out a star like it was a candle. How do you make problems for that character with that powerful? Definitely tough. Some people still seem to have a problem with <laughs> making that work today. Like, I mean, the Patrick Gleason, Pete Tomasi, uh, Superman, uh, Superman book from Rebirth was a great was a great use of Superman. And I would read, I would read like that. That I'm pretty sure that only lasted about a year or two. That sounds about right. Before Bendis took everything over, but I could, I would read, I would happily read a whole book, like. For at least a decade, like I would happily spend a decade reading Superman being like raising Jonathan and having his problems not be those of criminals, but raising his son. Yeah, I feel like for a long time there, there was always concern about Superman, you know, raising a family and everything and how interesting can it actually be. And Tomasi in particular is just so damn good. (laughs) So good. Well, don't forget, Dan Jurgens and Lee Weeks, they, they got the ball rolling with that. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad they did, because I... I'm, I'm glad they just finally went through with it. I, like, I they can't... Pulled, they pulled the trigger. And there's no way we're not going to be talking... There's no way we won't talk about uh, Sir, the death of Superman. But to me, like, that kind of felt like th- the way they treated uh, Connell afterwards mm-hmm. kind of felt like it was the closest thing that DC would concede to giving Superman a son. But then again, there was also for the man who has everything. Yeah. I was going to say, I was trying to think, was it around issue? Was it for some reason? 65 is the one in my head of Superboy where Superman finally gives him an actual name. I remember reading them being like, finally, finally, like Superman acknowledges him and kind of brings him into his like real life family. It was something that was long overdue, and I'm glad they did that, too. And that's the Carl Kessel uh, Superboy run, right? I think so. And he had kind of, like, some um, runs after... Let's see, he basically went up through issue 30, and then he took a little bit of a hiatus and came back around issue 49 or 50. And then he did another little run there. And so, like, he kind of... Little spurts. I can never remember exactly where he cut off and started again. Because I have a uh, a short box of comics that I was give, that was given to me for free by my therapist, mm-hmm. and I'd been ke- keeping it in my room just unopened, like a bunch of Su- Superboy, Aquaman stuff like that. Mm-hmm. When I had that my fall recently, where my, like a literal fall, not a metaphorical fall. I've been really, I've been really itching to uh, just go through th- and read them because they're literally just they're in they're in that that short box, bagged and boarded, and that's not how comics should be consumed. Nope. Dig into them. Like I think it was, I forgot who it was. Uh, Ken Smith mentioned on a like when he was doing, I think chasing Amy. There was a certain creator, like I think it may have been Mike Allred, who gave him like certain comics that like Men Man, and he stressed that like please don't bag and board them, just read like have, have people read them. Like it's, it's such a shame how. I mean, I sound like I, I'm coming off like grand, old Grandpa Allen, <laughs> which just feels weird saying because my grandpa was named Allen. <laughs> like saying, like just 
sent just me shaking my cane, my shillelagh at the moon, <laughs> saying, This is how it should be. <laughs> well, get back on topic here. Um, since we kind of <laughs> funny enough, Sp- Superman does kind of come up here a little bit later <laughs> for Spider Man. So, even with all the problems when it came to them not wanting to put Spider Man in the book. Uh, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko decided that they were going to do it anyways. And so they decided that with Amazing Adult Fantasy 15, which was going to be renamed into Amazing Fantasy for the final issue in the spring of 1962, um, even though the book was released in August. So boom, there's the year, 1962. I was two years off. Um, They figured this would be a good way to have the character in there. And, you know, if nobody liked him in there, well, guess what? It's done anyway, so <laughs> no loss. At least that's how uh, Stan Lee remembers it. Um, however, in the issue of Amazing Fantasy 15, they do have this announcement page from the editor on how Amazing is changing for future issues. So it sounds like there was an intention to continue the book, um, but must have decided to cancel it sometime between the creation of the book and it finally saying print. Um, According to Tom Bravort, he claims that there's a researcher named Will Murray who believes there's evidence pointing to Amazing Fantasy 16 being in the works based on, I guess, story job numbers found on splash pages. Just never saw a live day. So Amazing Fantasy 15 was the end of that series up until they kind of tried to revamp it. I think it was around 2000 or so, which we'll also touch on here a little bit later. So yeah, when I came to the Spider-Man, he was originally supposed to be designed by Jack Kirby with Steve Ditko inking. Um, however, Stanley wasn't really feeling Kirby's approach. Kirby tends to draw like bigger, stronger, masculine heroes. And Stan wanted Peter to look kind of like how we picture Peter. This He didn't want Peter to look like Captain America. He wanted him to look kind of weaker, more scrawny, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I can, I can see the whole where I can see where Stan's coming from, like with Captain America or C. C. Rogers. You have the strong, the virile, but Spider Man should should be the meek, mild, like nerdy, like the real version of. If only you look behind, look if you look deep inside, you'll see that I'm more than just this geek. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Jack actually did create kind of like what he wanted the Spider-Man character to look like. And I I put put that in the chat so you can kind of take a look at it in case you haven't seen it before. And it definitely has some similarities to uh, Captain America. Um, So yeah, Stan didn't really want that. And with Jack Kirby kind of already doing plenty at the time anyways, he decided he would take it over to Steve Ditko and let him design the character. And so that's exactly what Steve did. He designed the character um, and basically created the look of one of the most recognizable characters in the history of comics. And very possibly one of the most identifiable fictional characters in the world. So, you know, it was kind of a good choice. So (laughs) there's a little back and forth as to the creation of it, but... According to Ditko, the design of the character kind of went like this. First off, using a full mask was originally done to hide Peter's childish features, along with creating a sense of mystery to the character. This would allow for people to interpret Peter's expressions behind the mask kind of however they want, or they could even picture themselves as Spider-Man in their head. From there, he went over some of what Kirby had provided, uh, which was just like, I think it was three or four pages. and So he took that design and I guess there was like some sort of chest insignia. He says it was similar to Ant-Man in a way and would kind of keep that. But some of the other similarities, like a mask covering everything. Like a full full body suit. Yeah, it was more like a full body suit. You know, he Ditko compared a lot of what Kirby did with his design for Spider-Man to Captain America from, you know, kind of the mask that has like the open mouth, um, similar boots, a belt, stuff like that. And instead of shooting like 
webs from your wrist, Kirby had him using a gun that would shoot webs. And in Kirby's workup, he had Peter still living with his aunt and uncle. And so Ditko's not really sure if that was a Kirby choice or if that was a Stan Lee choice. So, you know, who knows there? Um, his uncle was a retired police officer, a police captain, that Ditko said compared a lot to Thunderbolt Ross. Um, and then at the end of the pages, had Peter walking toward a scientist house who lived in his neighborhood and was undergoing an experiment. And so quite possibly that would be how Peter would get his powers as opposed to the um, like school outing that he would end up going to. And, you know, even with all this, it's and we know how successful Spider-Man has been over the years. So clearly they made the right choice with going with Steve Ditko and all this and putting it in Amazing Fantasy 15. Um, not only did Spider-Man get featured on the cover, but it was Marvel's best-selling issue of the year. And that would lead to Spider-Man getting his own book in Amazing Spider-Man after the publisher came back to Stan claiming how much he loved the character and despite everything about possibly not putting in in the first place, you know, this was something that both him and Stan just loved so much. Um, and so this was in December and just a few months after Amazing Fantasy had been put out. So Marvel got to see those sales pretty, pretty quickly. So we kind of touched on the creation a little bit, but there is some controversy when it comes to Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> So anyone who kind of knows some stuff about comics may know that Stanley receives a ton of credit for his co-creations over the years. But sadly, some of those co-creators outside of Stan tend to get lost in history, especially for people who are not comic book fans. And this would be part of the reason that Steve Ditko would grow sour as well. Um, for a long time, especially in articles that were being written you know, back in the 60s and the 70s, Stanley was the only one that was being credited, credited as the creator of Spider-Man. And so this kind of came up with the definition of what makes you a creator. So in Stan's head, he saw himself as the sole creator of Spider-Man. He was the one with the original pitch. He was the one who thought up of the character's powers and the name. You know, and this was something that Steve and Stan would often get into discussions about because it frustrated Ditko like in, in Ditko's opinion, an idea means nothing until it becomes a physical thing. And which is what happens when the artist puts the idea on the page. And so it basically became this argument of is the creator, the one with the original idea, or is it the one that made the idea a reality? Yeah, it's, it's very similar to the, uh, Bob Kane, Bill Finger situation. Mm hmm. Yeah. But part of me wonders if that's, I'm sure we'll probably get to some of this too, but like Jack Kirby and Stan Lee and just all those creations as well. And I think pretty sure they would eventually drift apart a little bit too. Didn't they? I believe so. And when, yeah, it just seems and, like uh, Stan has a lot of problems when it comes to giving credit where credit is due in those early days. Yeah. I'm not sure what, when, like when it came to Iron Man, uh, Thor and, and, and Man, like, his brother, Larry Lieber, was like co-creator of those characters. Mm -hmm. Like Iron Man, for instance, was Stanley, Jack Kirby, Larry Lieber, and Don Heck. And it's just one of those weird things that... And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to derail the podcast again, but if you, look up, if you look up Larry Lieber as of 2012, it's basically how Stan would look if he had a goatee and was bold. <laughs> You're going to have to find me a picture of that. <laughs> I want to see that. Yeah, so, Dick, you know, Dicko was clearly not on the same wavelength as Stan with this argument, and this was something that he would hold a grudge about for years. Um, in 1999, he had a fanzine that was depicting his interpretation of Spider-Man's creation. There was one page that showed a split of Stan Lee's Spider-Man creation and Steve Ditko's Spider-Man creation. And then on Stan Lee's side, it was this blank box with the words Spider-Man. 
a one or two page synopsis for the artist who must draw 21 to 24 pages of story slash art panels. Dialogue must then be added working from the artist rough panel script. And then under Steve Ditko's section showed the artwork of him going into like further detail in one panel than what the original synopsis would have provided under Stan's section. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know about the Marvel method of the, of, of the era with DC where it, it was like scripts during Stanley and Jack, Stan and Jack's reign. It was like, have you, have you read um, comics of that era? Not too much of them now. Uh, so, like for example, uh, Fantastic Four, Jack would draw would draw the pit, would draw everything, pre before everything was written, and Stan would write the speech balloons or the word balloons. And when thinking about the when like re- thinking about this while reading certain issues of Fantastic Four, and the way Stan would would write, and the way he'd he'd have it. As if you two were reading the comic together, somehow, hmm. like the way he reacts to Silver Surfer's debut, <laughs> like this Silver Man who looks as if he's surfing. Yeah, I think I I had picked up some of the Masterworks Spider-Man sales um, that were going on Comicsology. Um, uh, I picked up some of the. <laughs> yeah, I picked up some of the Jerry Conway stuff, and you can still see some of that in there where he's like, oh, do you think the villain has ran away? Check the next page, because you'll be surprised or something. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I kind of like that goofy stuff where it's like, thank you, you know, omnipotent narrator <laughs> overseeing my enjoyment of this book. Clearly, Stan would grow to see that Dicko was bothered by this whole co-creator issue that they were having between each other. So Stan was going around. He was, he promised to tell everyone that they were co-creators. Um, this wasn't enough for Ditko. So Stan then went further and wrote something directly to Steve in the August, in August of 1999. Um, and this would detail Steve's involvement in Spider-Man's creation, both as the person who designed the costume and set the visual mood for the book but also how Steve would end up contributing more and more to those stories as it grew in popularity, including storytelling aspects such as plotting. And both that letter, um, the fanzine that Steve did, um, the designs from Jack Kirby, all this stuff I'm putting in our show notes um, on the website, vg.tv. So please check it out if you want to see all this stuff. It's a lot of cool, cool things. Um, And I'll have a lot more in there too. Sadly, even with this letter, it was not good enough for Steve uh, because Stan used the word considered as Steve as a co-creator. And so at this point, Stan stopped trying to mend this bridge that was broken and hasn't spoken. Well, I can't say hasn't since he's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they had, I guess, as far as I could tell, had never spoken to Steve since then at least this was there's a documentary out there a bbc documentary called in search of steve ditko and in that documentary they do an interview with stan who still does not exactly believe ditko's approach to co the book he still in in his mind believes it's a he's the sole creator but is willing to give ditko credit for it as well so uh, 2007 is when that documentary came out and people should watch that it has a lot of cool creators and stuff in there as well. So that's really cool. And so to make this whole controversy even more problematic, uh, Jack Kirby is also, was also known for taking credit for creating Spider-Man in a way. And so there were certainly elements taken from his original design, but altered once Deco took the reins of the character. Um, But it's hard to say exactly what elements of the background or the origin of the name as Ditko never spoke with Kirby directly regarding Spider-Man. So even Ditko is not exactly sure what parts were Stan, what parts were Jack, but Ditko is, was adamant that Kirby's influence was so small on the design aspect 
um, and much of it was flat out rejected or not used. That's hard for Kirby to be considered a creator in that respect. And that's something that him and both both Ditko and Stanley agreed on. So for the most part, it's a whole bunch of back and forth. Um, Joe Simon says that he created a character called Silver Spider, which would be reworked a bit into the fly for Archie Publications after it went nowhere with Harvey Comics. And then this was given to Kirby to make the change to the fly. And so Simon believes that when Stanley and Martin Goodman were needing new characters, Kirby proposed a Silver Spider-like character. And Simon says he spoke with Ditko about this and that Stan had given him pencils Kirby provided. And Ditko recognized it as the fly. Um, So Stan told Ditko to give it a new costume. So in a way, you could say that even Joe Simon had some (laughs) origins to the Spider-Man creation. Kirby, on the other hand, says he got the idea from a script he kept from Silver Spider. Uh, He claims both he and Joe Simon created Spider-Man for Crestwood Publications, which Simon disputes as Kirby just misremembering how that all went down. So again, this all just seems like a bunch of people with bits of a similar story where things aren't being pieced together perfectly over the years. Um, So I kind of tried my best attempt at detailing what happened. So here's my best try. So Joe Simon and Jack Kirby had an unused character in Silver Spider. Stan Lee and Martin Goodman and Jack Kirby would start running down new ideas for a new Marvel character. And Stanley proposed the idea of a character who could stick to walls, Spider-Man. Kirby would be the one to originally draw it, which is where he used the idea of Silver Spider to mock up some pages for a Spider-Man story. Stan wasn't liking the approach to how Kirby was drawing it, too heroic, for instance. So he took it to Steve Ditko along with the pages Kirby provided. Ditko ran with the idea, keeping maybe the chest logo from Kirby's costume and changing the web shooting gun to arm web shooters. Every other design aspect would be Ditko's. The world built around Peter Parker would probably be mostly from Stanley and Steve Ditko, but it's possible Kirby had some influence as well, such as living with an aunt and uncle, though it's hard to say. So that is my best attempt at kind of the whole, (laughs) how the whole controversy plays out. But yeah, it's a mess. I don't know how I ended up on Reddit. (laughs) Sometimes you just find yourself there and you don't know how. Yeah, I'm on, I, I'm on the explain like I'm five subreddit. <laughs> and it's what did Stan Lee do to Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby that people are still so upset about? And someone said like that Stan took Marvel's side when the major push started for creators rights and returning our work. So, which is which is probably I think that could be why the thing that made things like no going back Mm -hmm. between him and Kirby and like Stan became very rich from his time Marvel while most of the artists ended up broke and like there's another one that says just Stanley lies about his accomplishments saying that he told the story that as a child he entered a newspaper a creative writing contest and that he won so many times that the newspaper asked him to stop entering. <laughs> and apparently someone fact-checked the whole thing and he was listed as a runner-up <laughs> only once. But for those who don't know, Stan, Stan Lee is short for Stanley Lieber. And it's, it's, is it fair to call Bob Kane the Stan Lee of D.C.? Yeah, I think it would be. Because Bob Kane was known, or was his birth name was Bob Kahn, and he changed he changed his name to Bob Kane. Got a nose job as soon as he had the money back in the 30s. But I, I forgot who said it. It may have been Dwayne McDuffie. But or saying that comic books, the people are filled with, like, the a lot of the creators, at least during the 20th century. It was an industry full of people who weren't accepted, that desperately wanted to be accepted, which is why you get Captain America being a patriot or a man like Batman being a Bruce Wayne being a millionaire, Sir Man being just being the embodiment of Americana. And you, with Bob Kane and Stanley, 
you get two people who want to be who want to be more than what they are, and it costs it. It costs them karma. So, end of rant. So something a little bit less controversial was the name Spider Man. Um, so there, there's this joke that goes around. I know Dan Slot gets bothered by it a lot, and it comes to the infamous hyphen that I feel like a lot of people forget is in there. So it came. The whole reason that there's a hyphen in there is for one simple reason, and it's that Stan thought it looked too similar to Superman, and so he wanted to make the slight change to avoid any confusion. And this is something that came so late into the issue that the book had already been complete, which is why there is no hyphen throughout the first story of Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy 15. Um, you know, another little thing came with the original logo. Uh, the logo on the original artwork has a hyphenated, clean-looking Spider-Man. But on the page that was actually used back in that day, you can peel away that logo... Um, and again, I will put images on the site as well for all this. And underneath that new logo, you'll see the original logo as well, which has a non-hyphenated Spider-Man in there. The lettering is more jagged. Um, you know, there's webbing throughout each letter. And Stan thought the original design looked too gingerbready or too busy. And so they ended up switching it out. And thus the name Spider-Man was born. Um, it would start being showcased in his next appearance in The Amazing Spider-Man number one. And so unless there's anything you want to touch on with the creation after that, we could get into the stories of Amazing Fantasy 15. Nothing. Well, actually, no, I have more to add, but that's when we get to the actual story. Okay. Then, yeah, let's go ahead and get to Amazing Fantasy 15. Is he strong? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive blood. Can he swing from a thread? Take a look overhead. Hey there, there goes a Spider-Man. I was never really sure how long this issue was going to be. We had already done quite a few of older issues, so I imagined it was like another 64-page <laughs> book. Instead, I think it only came out to like 48 pages or so, so it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. But the stories also are not quite as dated as some of the other ones you've read. Um, there's one in two weeks that I'm going through, and there are some rough stories in that one. But these all these were all done by Stanley and Steve Ditko, which is something I also was not aware of. I assumed it was also going to be, you know, one dude would do this story, another would do this one. But they did all four. So the first one is Spider-Man. So, uh, hey guys, did you know that Peter Parker is an unlikable dork? Well, if you didn't, they sure hammer it home right here at the beginning. They make sure you understand real quick that he, nobody seems to like him other than his Aunt May and Uncle Ben, who love him like a son. Um, no girl wants to be with him. Flash Thompson is the biggest stud on campus. And Peter loves science. Like, you get all that within a page or two of, of the story. I mean, it's... I forgot which issue of Fantastic Four it was. It was the issue... It was the end of the Galactus... Like, the coming of Galactus story. Mm -hmm. Where it, get, it gets resolved a couple of ages into the next issue. Like, the, <laughs> the next issue. And it's just one of those things where I just... Uh, I love it. <laughs> Here's this big thing that suddenly disappears. <laughs> That, yeah, that's that's one of those things that always kind of bug me about certain stories. Like, make a big deal about something and then quickly sweep it under the rug like it didn't happen. So here we also see um, a science exhibit that's open to the public. And Peter's, you know, offering other people, you know, if they want to go with him. And, of course, nobody wants to. So it leaves him saying, they'll be sorry they laughed at me, which sounds like something a supervillain would say before <laughs> the, you know, he gets his powers and goes on a rampage. And so... Yeah. <laughs> okay, so have you, you read uh, Spider-Man Chapter 1, right? Is that the... Is that Burn? Yeah. I have not. I've seen it a lot, but I was never really sure if I really wanted to read it or not. 
it is basically an uh, basically just an updated version of this. Oh, is that like his Man of Steel kind of Spider-Man story? Well, it's not necessarily him reimagined. Like with Man of Steel, he reimagined mm-hmm. Siegel and Schuster's creation. But chapter one, he just told, he just told, he just retold the, st- the story, and oh. then it didn't add much new. Like it didn't add a lot to it. It was the equivalent of playing a PS Vita game or playing a game, a game like a video game port decades later that was not altered at all. <laughs> and I I don't know why, but when I was reading Amazing Fantasy fifteen, the fourteen pages that was a bit, that was in included in the um, Marvel Masterworks, my jaw nearly hit the floor uh, because of how how much they took. From this for for the uh, Tobey Maguire Spider Man, at least the origin, which I I can I think I I understand why people hate hate that hate his uh, trilogy. Yeah, that trilogy, it was fine. I don't love it like some other people do. Oh, I certainly I, I, I don't. adore it. <laughs> I certainly don't love Spider Man Two the way people do either. My grandmother passed away in two thousand three. Mm. In uh, January uh, 2003. And my parents had gotten me Spider-Man on DVD for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And it could just be the, me processing the whole thing, but I, I just repeatedly watched Spider-Man on a DVD player. And yeah, I'm pretty sure I have that whole movie memorized. <laughs> and like reading th- the story, it felt it felt great. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's there seems to be quite a bit of similarities. I'm kind of disappointed there's no bone saw, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what can you do? I guess. So yeah, Peter ends up going to the science exhibit, and it's, nobody wants to go with him. But they're testing out radioactivity, and it's here that we see a spider come through as they let it out, um, some waves, and in its dying throes, it bites a nearby Peter Parker. Um, and almost instantly, Peter starts feeling different. He feels as though his entire body is charged with some sort of fantastic energy. And, you know, at this point, he's left the exhibit and he's kind of walking down the street. And he almost gets hit by this car, but he ends up leaping a great distance instinctively out of the way. And, of course, the people in the car don't seem to take notice to this outstanding leap <laughs> that he does. And not only was it just a large leap, he actually ends up sticking to the wall after he jumps. And then he just begins scaling this giant building. Um, (laughs) Which, that part, not him, like, the car bit, but the wall bit, that was one of the marquee scenes of the Devin McGuire Spider-Man. As he he moves his hand to, like, move up the wall of the building, like, duh, duh, duh. (laughs) And that like look on his face, and he's like, "What? This is happening?" <laughs> yeah, and there's a there's a kid who's uh, walking by, and the kid sees him and mentions it to his mother, and his mom just blames the horror movie that they're leaving out. <laughs> yeah, uh, we see Peter then remark um, about the speed in which he climbs up this building, and when he gets to the top, he crushes the steel pipe, and then immediately pieces it together that this. All of this is happening because of that spider bite. And then on his way home, he sees this sign offering $100 for anyone who can stay in the ring for three minutes with Crusher Hogan, a wrestler. Peter, as we all know, takes up the challenge by throwing on an old white sweater and pants and wraps his head in. I I can't tell if it's a web or a pantyhose. I'm not entirely sure here. Um, but then he goes back and embarrasses Crusher Hogan. I, I have here a little bit of Stanley peeks through with dialogue with from one of the onlookers stating, sensational, fantastic, and that mask gimmick gives him just the right touch of mystery. He was terrific. <laughs> there is a TV producer who sees this as well and offers Peter a job, um, even allowing him to keep the mask. Uh, Peter goes home feeling pretty good and cobbles together the iconic Spider-Man costume. Uh, he also devises the web slingers and tests out the web strength as well, hanging from the scene. And that is where the end of part one concludes. Uh, part two 
enters with Spider-Man in front of the camera and people in awe. Uh, he walks backstage. He's hearing offers left and right of people wanting interviews or putting him in movies. Uh, but as he leaves them behind, he sees this thief running by and Peter doesn't do anything. There's no dialogue or anything between Peter and the thief, but the cop blames Peter anyways for not stopping him, which Peter just responds that it's, the cop's job and from now on he's looking out for himself back at home we see his uncle and aunt buy him a microscope and he's reminded of how great they are surely nothing bad is going to happen here yeah his uncle ben is two days away from retirement (laughs) yep we see spider-man becoming a huge sensation uh but one night coming home there's a cop at his he finds out his uncle has been murdered And the perpetrator is at an old warehouse, which Peter knows exactly where it's at. Um, In a rage, he puts on the Spider-Man outfit and web slings to the warehouse where he surprises the killer. Uh, Ditko does a great job kind of hiding the face of the killer for several panels before revealing after the crook attempts to escape multiple times and fails that it's the same man that Peter let pass him earlier. Peter leaves the crook hanging in midair from a web before walking off feeling guilty of feeling responsible for Uncle Ben's death. Again, this is straight up in Spider-Man 2002. Yep. (laughs) This, like, verbatim. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things, like, you're never... You know, I I had not read Amazing Fantasy 15 before this, and so I just assumed that Spider-Man movie just... You know, like, I'd I'd heard enough of the origin. I kind of figured this is probably a decent you know, interpretation of it. No, it's almost <laughs> like a one for one similarity to it. So I'm actually kind of, kind of impressed how well it still works today. Mixed in with uh, some Superman, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's the end of the Spider-Man story. Uh, it's pretty, pretty short and sweet. 14 pages, 14 pages. Like it got the job done. You know who Spider-Man is now. And yeah, that's it. That's, that's the origin of one of the most popular characters in history. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say about that story before we move on to these much shorter and less memorable <laughs> stories that they also wrote? I will say this about Stanley. It may have only been 14 pages, but Stanley and Steve did go to a, a lot in those 14 pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they tell you exactly who Peter is. They give you a good idea of what his home life is and care about him. They give you the origin of his powers and basically what, how he got them, what they ended up becoming, you know, what they ended up doing for him, uh, the origin of the costume, the death of his uncle, just, they filled a lot in <laughs> that short span that I feel like most books nowadays take freaking a whole year to, <laughs> to do as they try and draw out every little thing they can. I keep forgetting which, like how how long um, Uncle Ben survives in Ultimate Spider-Man. God, I don't know. I haven't read that story in years. I really should go back and read those. I th- I want to say it is. Like I feel like this is something a lot of more old time writers, in particular, still do pretty well. Is that they, if you pick up a book by someone like Keith Giffen, for example, you're going to have a lot of reading on your hands. Uh, whereas some of the more newer writers, I feel like you can get through their book relatively quickly. There's some girth in the writing to some of these people who've been around for 30, 40 years in the industry. And it definitely dates back to, you know, a lot of the older comics. It's just they're trying to tell complete stories in a span of, you know, half of what an issue is now. And so they cram pack those things with just text and so many panels on one page it's really impressive and you know you're getting your money's worth when you're getting stuff like that yeah um the origin story from this issue bendis reinterpreted it it over the course of seven issues (laughs) and uncle ben's he you know with most interpretations and reinterpretations of the spider-man canon it's like pocket where he it's one of those checklist things like to do like oh go did the Krypton did the Kent's found him now have to ha- now we have to kill Pa Kent. <laughs> uh, Uncle Ben dies in Ultimate Spider-Man issue four. 
let's see if each book is probably roughly what are they 28 pages 24 28 pages something like that times four you're looking at like what 106 pages to do a similar story to what they did in 14 pages <laughs> but if i remember right they also focused a lot on like peter's school life and you got to know more of the people there than what you did in this story here but yeah um it, it just even says here those were men's or original origin story and amazing fantasy one or 15 was only 11 pages long Bendis's retelling of his Spider Man's origin was seven issues long. <laughs> and funny, and just I just found this funny because it's Mark Bagley. He was wary at first of like the pace of the seven issues, <laughs> describing it as a, a quote real shock at first. So, yeah, teach their own. Like some writers like to kind of spread it out and try and work on other things here, but sometimes. I just like to get down to it. <laughs> That's exactly what Steve and Stan did. So what is the next story? So the next story is called The Bell Ringer. And The Bell Ringer tells the story of an old man named Pedros. Pedros was the village bell ringer on a small volcanic island. And every day he would get up and ring that bell each morning to save any boats that may be drifting too near. But one day the volcano became active. Um, everyone in the village were fear, was fearful of it erupting, and so they all started leaving, but Pedros was not going to leave. He had a bell to ring. Even if nobody could hear it, with the island deserted, there was a chance someone could hear it. So he wanted to you know, do his job. He wanted to make sure that if someone was getting too close, that he could at least save them from crashing into the island. And so the volcano ends up erupting and the island would be covered in lava. And, you know, he did exactly what he did every day. He rang that bell. Um, but as the bell tower starts being enveloped in fire and lava, a golden shaft of light shines down onto Pedro's from the sky. And then the last panel is him being lifted into the sky as the boats that surround the island basically have this story or myth or whatever now that some of them saw an old figure being lifted into the clouds through this golden chamber of light. And that is the story of the bell ringer. Like, I think it was three or four pages. So like very, it's like the exact opposite of Spider-Man where they do so much in 11 pages and bell ringer is just kind of, yeah, so just kind of goes, goes to heaven. Goes to heaven. Part of me wonders if like someone, some other writer tried to like pull Pedro's <laughs> further down. <laughs> Like Pedro's now became a celestial. <laughs> oh man, that that would be a great thing to see in a future Marvel like epic event. Like, <laughs> oh man, you know what they should have done? They should have had Civil War Two. They should have had. Um, <laughs> oh man, I'm forgetting his name. And the the main character of C Civil War Two, the Inhuman. They should have had him being a reincarnated version of Pedros. <laughs> who, who then ends up at the end of the story being like being confronted by the cosmic Marvel characters saying, do you want to come live with us? And he says, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm curious. I have to check because I would not be surprised if someone did end up bringing him back. Doesn't look like it, though. Oh, now I'm disappointed. That seems like something some writer would just end up doing just as like a. <laughs> you know, the only writer I can picture doing that would be Jeff Johns. He absolutely would do that. <laughs> Basically, that the issue of Tales of the Green Lantern Corps, where he pulled oh. all the Sinestro Corps slash Black, Black Knight stuff from, and what was supposed to be just a Alan Moore just crazy, goes to crazy town. And it's and it's a shame thing. It's a shame it didn't happen because, like that, Pedro's wasn't. I mean, Jeff Johns did write for Marvel. Mm -hmm. He 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 could have done. He could have, he could have tried to sell, <laughs> or he could have tried to sell uh, Joe Casada on. You know, I'm gonna take a character that Stan wrote about himself, Pedro's, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna make him an X Man because. <laughs> There was some issue of Ultimate X-Men. He did a backup story of... Oh, did he? Yeah. 
it is a real shame that comic book D- DB no longer exists <laughs> because that was that was like the best way to fact check th- things like this. Yeah, make Pedro say in one of the Eternals for all I care. Just bring him back somewhere. <laughs> Well, someone who's not going to be coming back is this person in the next story here. Uh, the story's called Man in the Mummy Case. So Rocco Rank is a crook <laughs> on the run from the police. Oh, uh, we ha- oh, how, how did we not talk about th- this? <laughs> <laughs> I just need to start making a tally of all these names we run across and enjoy. Um, back when I watched uh, The Big Bang Theory, before I actually had good taste... That that actually, the writers for the show actually brought up a valid point about Stanley, is that he there are too many characters he wrote about that had like Peter Parker, J. Jonah Jameson, um, who else? Who else? Robbie Rank, Millie the Model, and like Sue Storm. Just a bunch of characters with like uh, alliteration names. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. The whole like the plot of the episode was they're they're going to get their comics signed by Stanley, and the character who made this whole point, and he was like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell Stanley about this, like I'm gonna ask him why." The four of them walk in, having just come back from the whole thing. They're like, "I got my I got I got my, I got so and so signed, I got so and so signed, I got so and so signed," and the character Raj walks in, I didn't get. My comic signed by Stanley, so and like they're implying that Stanley got got mad at him. It's it's actual good. It's actually like a really <laughs> earned piece of humor from that show. Yeah, for a long time, I like I've been. I'm pretty positive so much of the Spider-Man character was taken from Superman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Clark Kent still has that alliteration in a way. Who works at the I guess back then it was the Daily Star as opposed to the Daily Bugle. Except well, Clark. actually, I don't. I don't know if Stanley like. There's sort of a case for um, the Daily Bugle. Have you ever heard of the the invent the Adventures of Super Pup? The Adventures of Super it sounds familiar. Okay, so when the tragedy of George Reeves happened, uh, Wendy Ellsworth, who was upper management at uh, DC. He tried to find, or he tried to make a actor safe version of the Adventures of Superman, called the Adventures of Super Pop, where all the characters would be reimagined as animals, <laughs> and the main character was Bark Bent, <laughs> aka Super Pop, who was a star reporter for the Daily Bugle. So I'd like. I show. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go find this. That's great. Yeah, you should be able to find. I can't. I can't find like a, the the whole pilot. Like the pilot never found a sponsor. Oh. And is and therefore has lost the time. But you can still find the Adventures of Super Pup intro. <laughs> and it's one of those things where like you want you see it, you want to watch more. I'm not talking nonsense. When I when um uh, when I, I was doing an episode like one of the in between seasons episodes of Smallville Chronicles, I I mentioned I just brought up uh, the Adventure Super Pop. The person we had on was like, I need to find I need to find out more about this. <laughs> Part of me wonders if they would, because I haven't watched the series yet, the crypto animated show that they had. That sounds like something that they would do too. Yeah, but they got um, I can't I can't say that I can't say the word because I can't say the name the type of person because I don't want to get I, I don't want to get canceled. So the next story is Man in the Mummy case. Uh, Rocco Rank is a crook on the run from the police. Um, as an officer draws near, he's able to leap in through a window, seemingly giving the officer the slip. Um, as he realizes he is in a museum, he realizes he's also not alone as a mummy is speaking to him. And the mummy is trying to assist in Rank's hiding. Um, Rank, clearly hesitant about listening to this creature that shouldn't even be alive, but he scared the cops and decides to take its advice. 
the mummy tells him to hide in the mummy case that it came from. He doesn't really like this idea, but the mummy convinces him otherwise. Um, the lid closes, and the mummy just stands right next to it as the cops rush in to try to find him. One cop gets the idea to check the mummy case in case he's hiding in there, but when he does, the case is empty, so they decide to move on. And then the mummy opens the case again, and with a menacing look, says that Rank will be safe from the pursuers forever. And then it shows Rank's face in horror, and each panel starts zooming out, and the final panel shows him in ancient Egypt being treated as a slave. Um, over his shoulder, there's a rope, and at the end of it, it's a giant block of rock having other slaves along with Rocco pulling it with a guard standing nearby, um, keeping him on track with a whip. That's the end of the mummy case. He gets sent back in time. <laughs> then the next one is called There Are Martians Among Us. And here we see an airliner. Um, it sees a spaceship pass by it and crash nearby. The pilot contacts some news sites to tell people what they saw, and a search party is sent out to investigate. Upon arriving at the crash site, they notice the ship is empty, which can only mean one thing. The Martians are hostile. Why else would they be hiding? <laughs> I like that little bit of logical leap as to uh, why some strangers from another planet wouldn't just chill out and wait for people to come find them. As if there was a global pandemic or something. People are still being urged to stay indoors, even after a month or so of no aliens being discovered. A couple are discussing their fear, but the man must leave for some reason. We see the search crew nearing the city where this couple live, and so seems to be hinting that the Martians could be close. And while he's gone, the woman realizes they have no coffee in the house. And so she must leave, because if her husband comes home and she doesn't have coffee ready, he's going to be very pissed. Um, so she decides to leave, and while she's out, she hears footsteps behind her, and the panels start closing in on her face with a looming shadow, and suddenly she's been taken. Uh, we see the man return home and finds his wife gone, and he's upset that she disobeyed him. He hurries to the phone and makes the call scared that his wife has been abducted, and in this like Twilight Zone-esque twist, we see a panel of the man with four arms now claiming his wife ruined everything and the bloodhounds must have found her and he will be next. Their identity as the Martians now exposed. I was not expecting that. <laughs> I wasn't. Stan, Stan Lee would make a good... He should have written for Twilight Zone. He really should have. Like, I wonder if this is what some of the other amazing fantasy issues are like, because if so, I kind of want to go back and read. Yeah. So really, that's... That's Amazing Fantasy 15. Those are the stories. Pretty good. I, I enjoyed this one. Is there anything you want to add to them before we get into the random trivia section? Yeah, it's a, it's a real shame that while you were talking, I was checking to see if Stanley and Steve did go over patch things up and doesn't appear they did. So. Hmm. Life's too short. Yeah. It's kind of a shame they weren't able to get back on good terms, but... What can you do at this point? Just hopefully, you know, ideally creators nowadays don't have the same problem. Um, I think it was a little bit more kind of Wild West back in the, I don't want to just say 60s, but <laughs> I'm sure this was a long time that stuff like this happened, but hopefully it's all better now in terms of getting, giving credit where credit is due. Would you say the, the new Uncharted territory now? is VR games, or just VR in general. Yeah, I feel like that's the kind of thing they're toying around with to see if they can do something with it, exactly. Because video games have been around for at least 40, 50 years. Yeah, quite a bit here for random trivia stuff. So one thing I wasn't expecting when I started doing research on this was to find that the original pages from the artwork of Amazing Fantasy 15 still exist, um, and they exist within the Library of Congress, of all places. Uh, there was apparently a mysterious donor who... This, okay, this mysterious donor, I guess, originally tried to give this artwork to Steve Ditko, 
and Ditko didn't want the pages, surprisingly. You know, which is surprising because Ditko is someone who was very much known for criticizing um, the industry for being rampant on stolen work. (laughs) And so to have him decline this artwork by someone who had the pages kind of surprised me. Um, But yeah, these pages include the original logo that is being covered up. Um, They have all these different notes from Stanley and the editor. So much are on these pages. It's really cool. I will post all these on VGU.tv as well. Go please check those out. Um, the the artwork fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> yes. If you uh, catch my drift. <laughs> I think they tried to actually find out who it was. I think one was an idea. But it was one of those things where they, they're not going to just flat out out the person who... <laughs> Who had them? So yeah, probably no. It could, it could have been just someone who, <laughs> who didn't want who didn't want the, the spotlight. Mm-hmm. I mean, clearly he didn't want them. He gave them away. He tried to give them back to the original creator and everything. So good Samaritan. That's what we'll call him or her. I don't know who it is, but in 2019, uh, Marvel ran a facsimile edition of Amazing Fantasy 15. Uh, this was a complete reprint of the original issues, along with everything that was inside of it from other stories. The ads, uh, features, all that kind of stuff. So you could probably find that for much cheaper than the original (laughs) original Amazing Fantasy 15. Another thing is uh, Jack Kirby's heirs tried filing a suit in 2009 claiming that Kirby had the rights to Spider-Man as being one of his original creators. Um, As we mentioned, Stan Lee denied this as the biggest influence Kirby had was creating the original cover and that the suit would be settled behind the scenes in 2014. Um, Nothing is known as far as I could find of what came out of it. So all that just kind of was brushed under the rug, but apparently Kirby's heirs did try to get something from it. And my guess is it didn't quite work out in their favor. (laughs) I think we all are uh, aware of the popular quote, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, It's probably the biggest phrase from comics. However, in Amazing Fantasy 15, it was never actually said. Um, It came from a narrative caption in the comic's last panel stating, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. This would be changed in later stories with Ben, who only has a couple of lines in this issue, um, being the one to use that phrase. Stan Lee never thought it would become something people would remember or widely use. But yet here we are, and everybody knows that phrase. Um, So everyone knows the cover of Amazing Fantasy 15, you know, Spider-Man swinging with the dude in his arms. Um, However, prior to Jack Kirby drawing it and Steve Ditko inking it, Ditko also drew a cover. Um, It's similar in that it features Spider-Man carrying a man in his arms, but it's more of a top-down view, so you see the street below. Um, This is another thing I will include on the website, so please go check that out. Um, Ditko approached it as being more like up close and personal with the character, like they were in on the action, whereas Kirby was more of a, you know, bystander in the crowd watching this character swing by. And Stan preferred Jack's cover, so that's the one they ultimately went with. Early in 2020, um, Amazing Fantasy 15 was sold in an auction for a whopping $795,000 at an auction in Dallas, Texas. It was graded a 9.4 by the CGC, which is just one of six known copies with this grade. There are four copies of these six that are known for, to have higher grades, uh, but this broke the record of a previously sold 1960s comic of $492,937.50. So it's no Action Comics number one, but still will bring you a very pretty penny if you were to get your hands on this issue. And then although Amazing Fantasy 15 released in 1962, Marvel did try at bridging the gap between that issue and Amazing Spider-Man number one much later in 1995. Um, thanks to editor Danny Fingeroth, this issue would serve as the connector issue between both Amazing Fantasy and Amazing Spider-Man 1. It would show Peter questioning what to do with his powers. It would have Uncle Ben's funeral all the stuff to kind of bridge that missing time between those two issues. You know, I mean, it was 33 years late, but 
they did it. And then not only would they do that, but they also bring back the Amazing Fantasy series as a second volume in 2004. Um, this would include the introduction of, I'm going to pronounce the name wrong, um, Arena, um, more recognized as Spider Girl, Anna Sophia Corazon. If I'm butchering that name, I do apologize. Um, however, in the new Amazing Fantasy 15, they tried to replicate the same success as Spider Man by introducing many new heroes, such as Mastermind Excello, who would turn out to be Amadeus Cho. Um, they would have Blackjack, Positron, and Monstro. Um, even the cover for this issue was a recreation of the original Amazing Fantasy 15 cover, but included all the characters watching Spider Man. Uh, speaking of cover homages, uh, much like we mentioned back on our Action Comics number one episode, Amazing Fancy 15 has been recreated so many times over the years. Um, some issues that have done that, Deadpool 11, Marvel Zombies number one, Spawn number 221, Bongo Comics Free For All 2010, Simpsons Comics 241, Lockjaw number three, and God knows how many times throughout the Spider-Man books over the years. It was also uh, recreated in the Spider-Man game, like in the 2018 game. Oh, that's right, it was. Yeah, when you're go- you take you grab the guy and go into uh, Fisk Tower. Mm-hmm. Because I'm looking at the uh, cover again, and yeah, that is that's is the exact same. <laughs> and uh, and also the uh, Steve D- Ditko version looks even better. I do like that Ditko version. And especially like the guy with the glasses who's looking at Spider Man, who just he looks like he's going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and like the guy is giving the he's giving, he's making a gesture like I, I'm 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 innocent. <laughs> There's something about heroes and just carrying the bad guys like high above the ground to scare them into things that happens in our. Next podcast that happened with Action Comics number one, and that happened with <laughs> the cover I think, here. Just <laughs> I don't think it's going to be Action number one. No, Searman holding that man as if he was a long box. <laughs> so to, good. To be fair, Spider Man never did the. Um, There's never any issue or piece of media where he pulled a, a Superman and just bent or, or rolled up the, a guy's gun. Like C- C- Conan O'Brien has a great bit where he's going through the NBC Universal Warehouse and he finds a, one of those types, of, those types of guns, like a rubber one, <laughs> and he just does this Superman thing with it. Like he Supermans it. And it's like, <laughs> Superman took my gun and rolled it up and he was smirking for two hours. So the last one I have here before we wrap everything up, um, Stan has two favorite characters, one of them, of course, being Spider-Man, the other being Silver Server. Um, the reason he likes Spidey so much is because, one, he's the most famous. Simple. <laughs> uh, Stan says he relates to him the most. He says nothing turns out perfect and things can go wrong, and that suits his life perfect. And then the third is the suit. Um, it allows anyone to relate to Spidey. Because he's fully covered, kids from all over the world could imagine they were underneath, no matter what they look like, how they spoke, just... It was a perfect way to allow kids to put themselves behind that mask. And so he always appreciated that as well. Yeah, like uh, Spider-Verse. Yep, just like Spider-Verse. And that's it. That's all I have for Amazing Fantasy 15. Oh, and- uh, before, before we wrap up. Remember Spider-Man Shared, uh, Shared Dimensions? Mm-hmm. Did you know that that influenced Spider-Verse? I could see that. I never finished no. Shared Dimensions, but yeah, I could definitely see the inspiration like not, there. Like the, like the actual um, the actual dance lot uh, written, like, story Spider-Verse. I was going to say, because the Shared Dimensions was, was it Peter David who did that one? Yeah. Yeah. Or if it wasn't, it was Chris Gage because he, it was those two they practically alternated the Spider-Man games. No way. Let's see here. Well, according to Wikipedia, Shared Dimensions was written by Dan. Dan, 
Oh man. <laughs> so yeah, I can. <laughs> he was lazy. He just redid the entire story all over again. <laughs> oh, that's great. I feel very invalidated. <laughs> Well, now I'm upset that I don't remember who, which one Peter David did. Web of Shadows, maybe? This one's not even going to tell me. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I always like that they brought in uh, actual writers from the books to do the, those video games. That's kind of how it should be done, in my opinion. <laughs> but yep, if you don't have anything else, I will go ahead and wrap the show up. Uh, I am trying to find it because I... Yeah, Peter David had to have done something, like some Spider-Man game. And I'll, I'll try to find it while you wrap up. <laughs> okay, yeah, because that's going to bother me now. That I can't... I'm positive his name is on those games. So, yeah, if you like everything you hear, uh, please spread the word of the podcast. Up until now, I've been saying rate and review on wherever you listen to these two, these podcasts on. But one of the podcasts that I listen to is Player One Podcast, who has been around for like 700 episodes now. And recently they mentioned that they're not even sure if rating and reviewing actually does anything in terms of numbers. They've never really noticed a difference, and they've stopped suggesting that for years now because it never actually... <laughs> did anything for them. They suggest that if you like a podcast, share it with your friends, share it with people who you think will like it, get the word out that way. Um, so yeah, I won't oppose anyone who wants to rate and review, but if you like what you hear and you think other people like it, please share it. Um, whether this is with friends, if you're on forums, Twitter, whatever, that's how uh, we'll grow. We were clo- you were close. He, Peter David wrote Edge of Time edge of time i had a feeling it was whatever other one that like yeah brought it was, in it other was, spider-man but i could not figure out i could not think of what the other game was called that's yeah I, I, sadly it was the one the, uh edge of time was the one that was poorly received mm-hmm. freaking friend or foe came up before edge of time <laughs> and i gotta love google there the way their analytics work I t- just typed in, I, I searched, did Peter David write a Spider-Man game? One of the auto-crack or auto-completes was, did Peter David write Spider-Man Homecoming? <laughs> Stay classy, internet. <laughs> well, considering how some of those other auto-searches come up, it could have been a lot worse. Also, don't forget to follow Hypertime to podcast on Twitter, at HypertimePod. Um, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can leave them there. Um, you can also email us at hypertime, the number two podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we also talk about video games. Um, if you follow us at vgu.tv, um, you can also follow our Twitter at vgu underscore TV. We have several podcasts from Players Club podcast, um, the Weekend News podcast, Win. There might be another one coming up, except that one's more movie related, right? That Ralph wants to do. Yeah, we're oh. currently we're currently in the process of workshopping that. Maybe it'll be figured out by the time this episode drops. I don't know. I mean, yeah, if we have we have a name for it, you'll have to tell hopefully. me off air. I don't think I've heard it yet. Yeah, I think I think you'll get a kick, kick out of it because <laughs> that's it's something that like brand wise fits perfectly with with uh, the concept. Cool. So yeah, if you like video game stuff, check us out at VG.TV. Um, check us, check out the podcast, uh, check out the YouTube, all that stuff. We try and give you stuff you like, so hopefully you like it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at jmilly 99 That's J-M-I-L-L-E-99. Um, Alan, where all can they follow you at? They can follow me on Twitter at the Alamir. That's the A-L-A-N. M-U-I-R. And it's time for the... Alan's Tweet of the bye week Uh, but which was destroyed? The Master or the Apprentice? Which one was destroyed? Is this a Star it's, Wars thing? It, it's, um, 
Mace Windu says it at, at, during Qui Gon <laughs> Jin's funeral during um, Phantom Menace. I was gonna say it sounds like a Star Wars thing. As someone yeah. who doesn't particularly like Star Wars, it sounds like a Star Wars thing. Yeah, because and that's not like a bad they, thing. I'm just saying. Right as they say, like right after that line, they like directorial shot of uh, they go to Anakin and Obi Wan talking, and then they just slowly rotate the camera into focus on Palpatine. Shame. It's a shame we'll never see Palpatine ever again. <laughs> I'm I'm glad to never see him again. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure they'll find some way. They always seem to. Oh, you know, he'll be coming back in the Lego Skywalker saga. <laughs> that that game that will hopefully be out by the time by yeah, sometime this year. It's supposed to. I wonder if that's the only Lego game too. They're usually pretty good about putting something out, but with COVID, who knows? <laughs> I'm glad that. I'm, yeah, I'm just glad that hopefully by this by this time next year, vaccines will be thoroughly distributed. Hope so. It'd be nice to <laughs> it'd be nice to get one. Yeah, I, and I, I, I'm I'm saying this as someone who is a shut in around this time last year. You know, I really want to really want to try to get back out there and COVID hit. <laughs> At first, I was like, oh, this, this is great. I can actually, everyone knows my pain. But then I realized, oh, I gotta get out of here. I'm gonna go crazy, man. <laughs> Meanwhile, COVID hit, and I'm like, yes, yes, I can't just stay at home and do nothing all the time. And then work called me in like two weeks later, and I had to start back to work. <laughs> I, do, I do have family members who have, who have gotten the vaccine. So and that's, that's, that's only because they work in the medical field. So. E- yeah, my mom is the same way. She had her first one last week, and I think she's supposed to go back in two or three weeks to get her second one. So yeah, hopefully everyone, if you're still listening to this, I hope you all take care. I, th- I thought you were going to say, I hope you're still alive. <laughs> hope you're still alive. I mean, who knows you- after, you know, <laughs> by the time March rolls around, what the world's going to be like, but... Probably know it could look like Mad Max. <laughs> it could. Oh, God. I'm really worried come next week and how everything is going to go down, but we'll see. By the time... Nobody might even know what we're talking about by the time this episode drops. Inauguration. (laughs) That's what I'm referring to. And some of the scares that come with it right now. Yeah, there was a tweet I was going to read. How did you do with that? Is it something that I responded to Emmett on Twitter with? (laughs) Yeah, I have debated about reading the... um... (laughs) The Captain America tweet uh, from Jack Kirby's son. Oh man, I I yeah, I actually, I actually read that. It was so good. Yeah, and thing is, because of loopholes, people the people who made those shirts get, can technically get away with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know Jerry Conway's tried to take back the Punisher logo. Um, clearly, that hasn't quite worked, but at least he's yeah. trying. I My respect. Brother, him. I- uh, my brother, who has a Punisher mask, like a face, Punisher face mask, mm-hmm. apparently got he got some looks, like some nasty, some some negative looks. Actually, some co- like a comment or two. Uh, and he just said, he, his response was, "What I like, I like, I like comics." <laughs> yeah, it's always funny to see like the creators come out anytime that their creation starts being used for things they don't like. And they're like, you people don't even know what the character is. Like he's com- the complete opposite of everything that you stand for. <laughs> Sometimes it feels good to know that the people you like in comics seem decent enough and follow your kind of moral standpoints. And do you notice that a lot, most of the time it's the pe- it's people who aren't like, that well known. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Pretty nice to not have Comics Gate bleed too much into a lot of the creators I like. So makes me feel good. <laughs> Especially when you're looking at, you know, you're also a fan of video games, and it seems like no matter where you look there, there's something disgusting that you have to be ashamed of. <laughs> I feel like comics, I don't, I can kind of ignore a good amount of that. It's just not as prevalent from, or they're not as vocal at least as the video game 
trash is. It's about amiibos and game journalism. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those people make me sick. But with that, <laughs> let's go ahead and end this episode. Uh, we will bid you all adieu. See you further down the hyper time, and I hope you all take care. Bye. Adios. This has been a VGU.TV production. For all of the hottest hot takes and other opinions on video games, music, and a lot more, tune in to VGU.TV.